What's up guys, back with another educational video, but before we get started, make sure you like, subscribe, and leave a comment for the algorithm. You know how we do. All right, this week, we are talking about low carb diets and glycemia. Recently, mostly on Twitter, a few people in the low carb community who I might have had some back and forth with before sent me a paper that was a meta-analysis of low carb diets with the primary outcomes being things like weight and HbA1c. What is HbA1c? HbA1c is glycosylated hemoglobin. Basically, HbA1c is a really good marker for long-term insulin sensitivity. If your blood glucose gets too high and stays too high over a long period of time, you're gonna have elevated levels of HbA1c as more of that glucose concentration is available to attach itself to the hemoglobin because there are spots on hemoglobin that can be glycosylated. Since red blood cells take about, I think 120 to 180 days to turn over, it tends to be a pretty good marker of what is your long-term levels of blood glucose and insulin sensitivity. So the conclusions of this study were that low carb diets linearly reduced body weight, HbA1c, blood pressure, and some other markers. We're really gonna focus on the weight and HbA1c primarily because those are the primary outcomes. That sounds really sexy, a linear decrease based on the decrease in carbohydrates. But this is why it's really, really, really important to not just read the abstract of a paper and to go in and actually read the entire paper and then read some of the citations as well. And especially when you're dealing with meta-analysis, read some of the individual studies as well that have been included because these are studies that have been lumped together. Now I'm not saying that meta-analyses are not good things to have, they're great. But the inclusion criteria, the exclusion criteria, and the specific individual studies make a very big difference on the outcome of a meta-analysis. The first big point I wanna bring up is their claims that there's a linear decrease in body weight are true at six months. They are not true at 12 months and they're not true beyond 12 months. Weight came back up, it was a U-shaped curve. Now we see that for most diets. Most diets, adherence weights, the longer the diet goes. So that's not something unique to low carb, but it's important to keep in mind. Furthermore, this meta-analysis did not account for calories. Part of the inclusion or exclusion criteria was not that calories had to be equated between groups. Many of these studies were free living studies where they basically said, hey, here's counseling on low carb diets. By the way, here's a pamphlet on weight loss. Go have fun. And you know, in those studies, they see a much greater amount of weight loss in the low carb diets compared to the whatever eat healthy diet. That's not surprising. Most people have a difficult time without sustained intervention from professionals who are giving them counseling on dietary quality and those sorts of things. Whereas if you give somebody a diet that's a little bit simpler in terms of, I just gotta not eat these foods, they tend to do better at least in the short term. Some people would say, well, that's a great reason to do low carb, and it might be. It might be for the individual, but what we see on the whole is adherence rates are not really different in the long term with low carb compared to other diets. So it really appears to be an individual thing. Now getting back to the data on weight loss and HbA1c, if we look at the six month data, yes, there is a linear decrease in body weight, there is a linear decrease in HbA1c. Interestingly, decreasing body weight in and of itself decreases HbA1c. In fact, for each kilogram of weight loss, there is usually a reduction of 0.1% of HbA1c. In this study, at six months, the low carbohydrate diets had a 1.44 kilogram greater weight loss. That means around 0.14 to 0.15 of the percent difference in HbA1c could be attributed to simply loss of body weight and not necessarily just independent effects of a low carb diet. What I'm saying is actually exactly what the researchers said in the conclusions of the study, which is low carb diets tend to just be low calorie diets. And it's very difficult to disentangle the effects of weight loss and HbA1c and just say, well, it's based on carbohydrate. And if you look at some of the individual studies like Tay et al. from 2014, in that study, when they look at the people in the low carb diet versus the high carb diet who achieved remission, the average weight loss was 12 kilograms in both diets. What that says is when people lose the same amount of weight, they get similar reductions in HbA1c, if not the same. I will say, based on this meta-analysis, it seems like there may be a small independent effect of low carb diets on HbA1c, maybe like 0.015% of reduction beyond what you get from just losing weight. But it's unknown what the clinical relevance of that is. 
So I'm not saying that there could be no extra benefit to low carb diets, but if there is, it's pretty small. Weight loss appears to account for about 70 to 80% of the effects of diet on HbA1c. If a low carb diet is easy for you to stick to and you enjoy it, then absolutely do it because it does appear to improve glycemia and it can help you lose weight. But if you don't like doing a low carb diet and it's easier for you to stick to a higher carb diet or a more moderate diet, then that's probably still better for HbA1c in the long term because if it's easier to adhere to, you're going to stay with it, you're going to sustain the weight loss better and your HbA1c is gonna be better. So again, I think the point I'm trying to make is let's not step over dollars to pick up pennies. If you can get the dollar and get the penny along with it, great. But if you have to pick up the penny and miss the dollar, don't do that. So again, don't force yourself to do a low carb diet because you feel like it's the only way to get results. Now I wanna shout out a researcher named Nicola Guest because she brought this point up and I would have totally missed it. When they look at the data and they look at type two diabetes remission with no medications involved, they see no difference between high carb and low carb. That's a pretty important distinction. Now again, I'm not saying that there's no effect of low carb. What I'm saying is I don't think this meta-analysis is a strong case for low carb superiority. I think it raises some interesting questions that if we can get more studies that aren't quite so heterogeneous, put them together into a meta-analysis and control for a few more confounding variables like calories, protein, then maybe we can start to disentangle this stuff a little bit better. But when it comes to this study, as what it's being used in the low carb community, which is kind of like spiking the football and then celebrating that we've shown that you know low carb is the best thing ever, it's really not a strong indicator of that. What it really shows is that most diets aren't sustainable for most people because at 12 months these effects go away. Most of the health benefits from these diets are simply due to the weight loss that's been incurred. Having less adiposity is positive for blood glucose, HbA1c, insulin sensitivity, inflammation, you name it. Less adiposity is typically better. I think it's strong evidence for those things. I don't think it's real strong evidence for drastic superiority of low carb diets. I feel like a broken record because I don't want people to straw man what I'm saying. If a low carb diet is something you enjoy and it's easy for you to stick to, then by all means, that is a great reason to do it. But if you prefer another methodology, whatever it is, flexible dieting, intermittent fasting, you name it. If you prefer another methodology that feels easy for you, then it's okay to use that too because at the end of the day, whatever produces the most sustained reductions in adiposity is going to have the most overall favorable health effects for most people in the long run. And that's always my focus when I'm analyzing this data, is what does this mean in the context of the long run? And people will try to pigeonhole me into, well, you just hate anything low carb. I would love to know that there's specific diets that actually have better effects on health. I think that would be amazing. I just don't think the data is very strong to show that. But if I didn't like low carb diets, our app Carbon Diet Coach wouldn't have two low carb settings on it, a reduced carbohydrate and ketogenic setting. What feels easy for one person in terms of a diet may be very difficult for another person. And you should do as the individual what feels least restrictive for you and most sustainable. Guys, if you like these study breakdowns, if you like to go deep but have it explained in a way that makes sense to the average person, please check out our research review reps. The links are in the description. Every month we take five studies and break them down in a way that's palatable for anybody to understand, even people who don't have a scientific background. And we don't use a bunch of unnecessary scientific jargon or anything like that. And we break down these studies, go deep, give you our opinions on the data and give you the author's conclusions. And if we disagree with them, we'll tell you based on what they tested, how they tested it, all those sorts of things. And not only that, we will give you practical recommendations based on these data. So whatever a study shows at the end of our review, we'll give you our practical recommendations based on what we've discussed. All right, guys, if you're interested in reps, click the link in the description. Hope you enjoyed the video. I'll catch you next week.